Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the first time in 37 years as a pastor and four years of seminary that I've ever begun a sermon with those words. And there's a reason for that. When I was growing up as a kid, I believe every sermon I ever heard in church started that way. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I can actually remember sitting there and moving my lips to those words. <laughs> I found myself wondering as a youngster why in the world they always started the same way. And then I got to the seminary and I found out. Nobody ever said you had to do it that way, but it was expected and everybody did. And I just remember saying, I'm not going to do this. Because if we simply say it over and over again, it basically becomes white noise rather than something that you really think about. And as a result, for 37 years as a pastor and four more as a seminary student, I never began a message that way until this morning. And here's why. Thursday morning early, I was walking into work. Love doing that. It's a great time to talk to God. And along the way, I had the overwhelming sense that I was supposed to preach on grace and peace to you. I know those words occur frequently in the Bible. I knew they are often paired together. I didn't realize until Thursday morning how many times they're paired together. And as a result, this is what I discovered. Romans 1 verse 7, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1, 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, grace and peace to you. 2 Thessalonians 1, 2, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1 verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Timothy 1 verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Titus 1 4, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Philemon 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 2, grace and peace be yours in abundance. 2 Peter 1 verse 2, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 2 John 3, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. And Revelation 1, 4 and 5, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Wow. 17 times. You counted well there, Sidney. 17 times. Grace and peace. It's not white noise. It's power. And if you look at those verses, you will notice they are spoken or written, I should say, by the apostles Paul and Peter and John. And what they have done is they have changed the way we greet one another. You see, in the first century, the traditional way of greeting Jewish people was to say, Shalom. We talked about that last week. Shalom. 
The traditional way non-Jews greeted one another in a letter was to say karain, which means greetings, kind of the equivalent of greetings and salutations. You know. That's even the way early believers sent a letter. After the first, the first convention of followers of Jesus, we read about it in Acts chapter 15. In verse 23, they reached a decision and they sent a message, a letter to the believers. This is the way the letter began. It's like this, verse 23. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings, Karain, greetings. But as believers spread out through the empire, and as more and more people came to receive Jesus as their Savior, they actually changed the way they wrote their letters. And a new form of greeting emerged. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Not just greetings, not just peace, but grace and peace. Grace, it's the Greek word charis. Do you know what it means? Unmerited favor. Unmerited, undeserved favor. That's what God offers to his children. Unmerited favor. To know that God looks upon you and me with favor brings incredible peace. To know that God considers us not only to be valuable, but to be his treasured possession. That God pours out grace on his children, unmerited favor. The Hebrew word for that is hen. It appears over and again in the Hebrew scriptures. The first time it appears is in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 8, where it says, Noah found favor with the Lord God. Unmerited favor. That's grace. That's what God gives. And that is the message that God seeks to place before his children each day. Grace and peace. Grace, the incredible grace of God that occurs time and time and time again in the Bible. Grace, undeserved favor. That is the heart of the Bible's message. And so this morning, I'd just like to take a few moments to reflect on those two words and what they say to each and every one of us today. Grace and peace to you. You heard all 17 times just a moment ago. Did you notice that although the words change from time to time and little things are added and some things deleted, one thing remains constant, and that is grace always comes before peace. Grace always comes before peace. And that is a profound truth. Because you see, until you and I receive the undeserved favor of God, we will never have peace within. Until you and I come face to face with the amazing love of God in Jesus Christ, we will never know peace. Grace must always come first. And so today... If you are in one of those situations where your life is in upheaval and you are just troubled and overwhelmed by the things going on, the first thing God desires to say to you is grace, undeserved favor. In Christ Jesus, God offers you his favor. You may look at your life and say, oh, but right now, I, I just can't even see straight. And what God is saying is, but I can. And I see you, and I know you, and I love you, and I gave my son for you. And these momentary troubles that you are going through right now are just that. 
They are momentary. So look to my grace, my undeserved favor, and let that wash over you. Because you see, that's the second truth here. That grace, that undeserved favor, it comes from the Father. We live in a world where many people say, including many people who call themselves part of the church, where many people say, well, God's angry at me. God is, God's a mean God. And nothing could be further from the truth. Our God is a good God. He is a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's what the scripture declares over and over and over again. And that's not white noise. The Father loves you. The Father cares for you. You may have been abandoned by your own father, but your heavenly father will never turn his back on you. In fact, he will come seeking you. And if you have bought into the lie of the enemy that says, oh, God's out to get you, the father wants to get you. That is not true. The father wants to get hold of you. He wants to call you to himself. He desires to draw every human being to himself because he is good and gracious and merciful. And if you say to yourself, yeah, but if you knew what I've done in my life, if you knew how I've blown it in so many ways, you'd know he'd never have anything to do with me. To which I would say, grace to you. Grace always comes first, and that's undeserved favor unearned, undeserved, unpaid for on your own. It is undeserved, but it is favor. And that's what God seeks to communicate to his children, to his creation. Undeserved favor, pure, abounding, abiding grace. It comes from the Father above. But number three, it comes from the Lord Jesus. Grace comes from Jesus. The Apostle John says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth, undeserved favor, absolute truth comes from Jesus Christ. And that is also what God desires to speak into your life and mine. That undeserved favor is found in Jesus. And that means that you and I can simply set aside the old worldly way of trying to work our way into God's favor or ignoring God, figuring that, ah, oh, well, we may as well live it up now. Instead, what God is saying is come to me and let my son take over in your life. Let his love and his mercy flow in. Let his goodness and his holiness be evident. Let his incredible call of discipleship grab your heart and your soul and watch what he will do. Grace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a good God. He is gracious and merciful to his children. And he desires to bless, even in the midst of the greatest trials and the most profound difficulties, even in a world that is falling apart, God pours out grace, undeserved favor. And he does it because his son has paid the price, because Jesus has borne every one of our burdens, because he has carried every one of our sins, because he has taken on himself all of our shame and all of our guilt and paid it all. There is grace from the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is more. There's also peace from the Father. The Father brings peace to His children. Last week we talked about that beautiful Hebrew word, shalom, that means far more than the lack of violence or warfare. It means that everything is resolved and made right and pure. 
And what God desires to do is to bring that peace into your heart and into mine. And the Father does that. Because he assures us that even in a world that is crumbling and shaking, and boy, there's been a lot of shaking this past week, hasn't there? In a world that is crumbling and shaking, God brings peace to those who call upon him. And the Father says, and he promises in his word, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says that in the end, all who call upon the name of the Lord will experience the glory of his presence and the glory and joy of being with him forever. And therefore, he says, do not be discouraged, do not be distraught, do not be afraid. Instead, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. That brings peace. The peace of knowing that no matter how crazy life may be, in the end, God has this. And he will redeem it and restore it. And he will take his creation and remake and rebuild and renew it. And that is going to last forever. Right now, the troubles of life seem pretty imposing and pretty powerful. But in the overall scheme of things, they are but a flash in time. And the Lord says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, Jesus says. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. The Greek word is thlipsis. It means persecution difficulty, trial, painful ordeals. Jesus does not say, if you follow me, you'll never have any problems. That's not what he says, but what he does say is if you follow me, you will have peace because he is our peace. He has broken the power of the enemy by his own death and resurrection. He has broken the power of our past sin by paying for them in full on the cross. He has broken the power of the adversary over us by trouncing him and crushing his head. He has broken even the chains that have held us for so long by his glorious resurrection and ascension. And in him, there is peace, true peace. We get a glimpse of it today it becomes stronger as we experience him more. But in the end, we will know peace in all of its fullness when he returns. Grace and peace to you through God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. Not once, not twice, but over and over and over again. And that leads us to one final truth this morning. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. We read it earlier. I'd like to take a look at it once again. Note how Peter offers a prayer for grace and peace. Here's the way the translators put it. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Translated literally, it reads like this, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And what Peter is saying is his prayer is and God's promise is that grace, undeserved favor and peace, deep comfort will be multiplied in our lives through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And that is not mere head knowledge. That is not knowing about God and knowing about Jesus our Lord. It's about knowing God and knowing Jesus our Lord, living in his presence, experiencing his power, understanding his comfort, walking in obedience, living by faith, following no matter the cost, because we know the price has been paid for us and it's been paid in full. And God's desire is to multiply grace and peace in your life and in mine 
through the knowledge of him, through knowing him, understanding his amazing, amazing goodness, his incredible faithfulness, his his overwhelming, undeserved favor. Because no matter how we stumble and no matter how we may have fallen, we are still his precious children. And Jesus paid the price for us all. And he invites us to live in him. And as we do, as we know him more and more, grace and peace are multiplied in our lives. Isn't that a powerful word? An incredible comfort. And I might add, an amazing inspiration and encouragement to live the life of faith, to walk with God, to know Him more and more, and to experience in Him the fullness of multiplied, undeserved favor and deep, abiding peace of the soul. God grant that to each and every one of us Or to put it another way, grace, mercy, and peace to you through God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Could we just pray? Father, we thank you for your undeserved favor. And we pray, Lord, that the realization of that truth would change this week for each and every one of us. We pray, Lord, that you would bring into our lives more and more your deep peace in Christ, that we may rise to the occasions that you set before us, that we may throw aside those things that have hindered us, that we may dispense with the sin that so often grips us, and may instead live in the joy and knowledge that we are loved by you, that you bring peace to our hearts, and you will bring the final victory in Christ Jesus, our returning Savior. To him be the praise now and always. Amen and amen.